You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Previously on Prophet Pearls. So you lose all of that when you when you just translate it as the hearth of the altar or altar. Um, one more uh, passage, which is not in the Tanakh. It's actually in um, the Mesha uh, uh, Steli. There, uh, there was a king of Moab, of the Moabites, called Mesha, Mem Yud Shin Ayin. And Mesha uh, set up a, a large monument which, in which he wrote in Moabite, which is almost identical to biblical Hebrew. And he describes his victorious war against Israel. It's actually the opening verses of two kings describing the same war. Um, pretty uh-huh. cool. He says, the men of God, that is G-A-D, not G-O-D, <laughs> uh, the tribe of God. Uh-huh. The men of God dwelt in the land of Atarot forever, and the king of Israel built up for himself Atarot. That's a city in Transjordan. I fought against uh-huh. the city. This is Mesha speaking, the king of Moab. I fought against the city and captured it. I killed all the people and offered the city as a sacrifice to Kamosh. That's the God of the Moabites. Imagine that. He's wiping out the city of the Israelites, and he's, and he's killing the people, offering them as a sacrifice to Kamosh. That sounds like some things that are going on today in northern Iraq and in, and in, uh, and in Syria and, and what the Boko Haram are doing in northern Nigeria. They're offering up people as sacrifices to their gods. They're, they're modern-day Moabites. He says, I took captive from there the Ariel of David and dragged it before Kamosh in Kriot. Kriot was one of the cities of, of the Moabites. What on earth is the Ariel of David, the Ariel of David, that is being dragged before the the idol of commotion in the in the in the in this Moabite city? Is that the um, the 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 warrior, meaning the champion, who was you know who went out and and taunted maybe the Moabites and he was captured, or is it actually the altar? That was dragged, some kind of movable altar that shouldn't have been there in the first place of a high place. And why is it called the Ariel of David? I mean, this this is kind of mysterious. We don't know. Um, we don't know the answer to this. But it's interesting that the two places where we have Ariel uh, in the Tanakh, two of the places, are both in Moabite contexts. One is in this Moabite inscription, and the other is defeating the, the Ariels of the Moabites. And some people have even suggested that Ariel, in the sense of a warrior, actually may be a Moabite word, whereas in Hebrew, Ariel referred to the altar, both of them literally meaning Lion of God. Interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything on the Cubit? Well, is it and, the word that, of the week? Well, no, no. So the word of the week is Ariel. Can, we, can that be the word well, of the week? Well, that's what I was going to ask. Can you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you explain? Okay, Ariel is the word of the week. <laughs> and, um, it, and my sister, by the way, her name is Ariella, which is the feminine of Ariel. Um, mm-hmm. And Ariel is, um, as I said, it, it's understood to refer to both Jerusalem and the altar. Yours translates it as hearth. That's actually based on Arabic. There's no evidence of that. Mm-hmm. Ariel refers to the altar itself um, and the city in which the altar uh, stood. Um, and Ariel is Aleph, Resh, Yud, Aleph, Lamed. And that's simply two words, Ari, Aleph, Resh, Yud, which is lion, and El, which is God or mighty one, um, Aleph, Lamed. There it is. So uh, the mighty one of God, the, the, the lion of God, the lion of the mighty one is Ariel. Um, and I should point out in verse Impressive. 15. Five, that, five letters, two words, yeah. and we've got Ariel. I like it. There we do. There we got it. And okay. of course, that is also the character. Isn't that the character in um, in in like that mermaid movie? Isn't her name Ariel? Nehemia, you watch those kinds of things. You know I don't watch those <laughs> no, kinds of things. No, it's Disney. Okay? You can't watch Disney. <laughs> I know you watch Disney. Um, so, and, and I always thought that was funny when I heard that, you know, this character named Ariel, and she's, she's the, oh, the little mermaid it's called. And, um, and it's a she because Ariel is a masculine word in Hebrew. Ariella is the feminine. Uh, of course, we have Ariel Sharon, the former prime minister. Are you with us? What's going on? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So let's skip ahead um, to verse 19. Can you read us verse 19? Wait, actually, let's stop there. I, I got to talk about verse 18. Can you re- please read verse 18? Yeah, so so when I say I'm here and I'm, I'm doing something, that means that you got to keep reading because I'm trying to keep us recorded. <laughs> When I'm back to 18, <laughs> then he said to me, son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says. There will be the regulations for sacrificing bird offerings and sprinkling blood upon the altar when it is built. Okay. So we got to stop for a moment and just raise some questions here. And, and, and I hope you're with us because you're going to need to field this. Yep. So, yep. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard from Christians is that 
Jesus came and he was the final sacrifice, and after that, the sacrificial system has been abolished. And all you have to do is read in the book of Acts, and you'll find out that, that Paul was actually involved in a sacrifice in Jerusalem in the temple after the crucifixion. So that doesn't even really fit with the New Testament. Um, but how, how in your Methodist church did they explain this passage, that there's going to be sacrifices, burnt offerings, and there's going to be blood? And remember, blood has to do with the blood is for the atonement. So they're, they're sprinkling blood on the altar in the time of Ezekiel's temple. So how did, how did, did you guys deal with this in the Methodist church, or did you just ignore it? No, we didn't deal with this sort of thing, Nehemiah. Okay. So it's really interesting. No, I've, we read, I've read about this in, in uh, classical Christian commentaries, meaning like you know Augustine and people like that. Um, and they talk about what the Christians call St. Augustine. And, and their explanation is that, well, this is not to be taken literally. There will never be an altar in fact, when, when Ezekiel saw this vision, he saw an altar. But what the altar represents is, and, and then he comes up with some explanation, the Catholic Church or the cathedral, and then the sprinkling of the, sprinkling of the blood that represents the Eucharist and the church, you know, drinking of the wine and eating of the, uh, of the wafer. Um, so what they do is they say all, this whole section in Ezekiel, really chapters 40 through 48 of Ezekiel, according to um, Catholic and um, Greek Orthodox traditional Christian commentators in the Christian world, these are all symbols, symbols of things that will uh, take place, as they say, in the life of the church. And it actually isn't meant to be taken literally. And, it's, and, it's, and in this respect, Jews take the Bible literally. We absolutely do. There's obviously metaphors and symbols. But in this case, when Ezekiel describes a temple being built, and he says it's so many cubits this way and so many cubits that way, we literally understand that there will be a temple like this that will be built under the reign of the King Messiah, or in that period some, somehow, and um, that will be the final temple um, f during the reign of the King Messiah on earth. So in that respect, you could say Jews are literalists, um, even though obviously the symbols and metaphors that, you know, when he's talking about cubits and things like this, yeah, this is actually a temple that will be built. Mm -hmm. In other words, in other, uh, sort of to back up, yeah. th there's no need to, to over the matter that what Ezekiel is seeing is the temple that, that, that will be that will be built that will be there that will physically be there, and that temple w won't be uh, uh, a temple that doesn't have, but rather that does have the very things that were in the original temple. Meaning the idea of having an altar, having you know, place to well, sacrifice. Well, verse nineteen and those speaks sort of about hatat, the sin offering. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there, there will be sin offerings even in this future temple. And look, you you said it, we don't need to um, to to spiritualize it or over spiritualize it. I'm not telling Catholics they shouldn't spiritualize it. I think Catholics do need to spiritualize it because they say sacrifices have been done away with. And so they come to a verse like verse 19 where it speaks about sin offerings, and, and they have no choice but to spiritualize it because it contradicts their theology. Um, as a literalist, in, in the respect of I take the Bible at face value – um, I say a sin offering really is a sin offering. I don't. Ha I don't need a spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't need to spiritualize it. They do. That's my point. You, you know why? We, let me just. I will weigh yeah. in here. The, yeah. the reason that there really doesn't need to be too much of an argument regarding yeah. this is that maybe what you don't realize, Nehemia, as you say, uh, uh, the Jews take the Bible literally, and the, and the, and the temple that's going to be built, and and Ezekiel, and all. I think you're confused. I, I really have to challenge you on yeah. something. I think you're confused. You think that the Catholic Church and even the Methodist Church and, and many of the churches that are, are presently uh, promoting what they're promoting are actually looking at Ezekiel and saying that oh, the so verse I, in Ezekiel is Oh, so I've looked at the Catholic and Greek so let me, let me, let me finish. Let me finish. And so, they do so, talk so what about I'm this. saying is – what, what I'm saying is is yeah. that when you – you know, it's, it's almost easy. It's almost an easy target yeah. because what you find in the Catholic Church, what you find in – continuously more and more and more in the Protestant denominations is they're not opening the Bible. They're more like that, the, the, the rabbi at that reform synagogue, if anything, who says, uh, Moses, what are you talking about? Altar? What do you mean? But this is just pictures. This is, these are nice things that you use every once in a while. What we're doing right now that I think is so powerful is we're opening up the scripture. We're saying we find common ground in the scriptures, the Holy Bible, the word of God, and we think it's good for yesterday, today, tomorrow. Amen. I wish... Yeah that that was the conversation in, in the Methodist church. I wish it was. Now, how do we deal with verse 19? Verse 19, we're not even reading verse 19. It's not even in the conversation. Right. So my point is, is that what we're trying to do is so different. Right. And especially for you, it's so different because I, I, and I know this is where you'll, hopefully this thing will cut off. What I'm <laughs> continuously frustrated about is that we're not using the scripture as scripture. We're not opening it and asking, what does it mean yesterday, today, and tomorrow? It's not even in the conversation. 
there's books of discipline. There's the there's the rules and regulations of the pope. There's the saint statements. There's all this other stuff that's going on. And what I'm trying to do, to be honest with you, is let's have the conversation about scripture. When a rabbi yeah. says, we don't know if Moses exists, or when a preacher says, or a bishop says, or a pope says, well, that we don't only think, no, that's, or, or a president says, no. but you really want to open the Bible? You want to apply the Bible? The Bible's an old, dusty old book. It's not good for us. I disagree. It Amen. is good. And for those that believe it, have to ask answer the question that you brought up. Do yeah. we look at Ezekiel and say this is practical? It's legitimate. It's 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 real. Or do we over spiritualize and say, well, you know, that's not something we're going to deal with. And what you did do, and again, you're you're the one that's done this throughout Prophet Pearls. I don't know why you do it. Yeah. You continually you'll bring up something from the New Testament, and it'll be a question. And you're and you're doing that. And I and I and I appreciate why you're doing it because you're asking the question: Was this something that was meant? That, in other words. Sacrifice is continuing. Paul going to the temple. He didn't go to the temple and say, well, it's good. There's no sacrifice. He did vows. He he went to the temple for during Shavuot, and he went to the temple, said he had to be in Jerusalem for that time because it was continuing. Mm-hmm. So and it will you continue know, I get excited about Ezekiel. it. And, and the yeah. reason, I, reason yeah. I do that is that you're being this you – know, <laughs> you're not being a good Methodist. <laughs> So, and, and, I, and I do – I want to respectfully consider this from the different perspectives, and that's why I say I'm not saying the Catholic is wrong from his perspective. The Catholic needs to say this, and he has an internally consistent system of theology. It's just not my system. My system is well, – And the, what I'm saying yeah. is the Catholic is wrong. Here's well, the problem that I'm having. Say. And you look yeah. – and you know, we're going to get into this. When we're face-to-face, we'll be able to yeah. fight about it more. But here's where I, I, I do say the Catholic has a problem yeah. because either this is the word of God. Yeah. Just yesterday, just yesterday. Well, he's got I'm a problem. The question is how does, he sign, how, does he, how does he solve it? it? it now and he we're solves talking. it by spiritualizing it. I solve exactly. it by saying it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and I solve it by says. saying let's look and find out what it meant. Yeah. Let's ask what it meant what it means and what it will mean. Amen. And I think we just did that. We yeah. just did Prophet Pearls, the very tagline. Yeah. What was it? What is it and what will it be? Amen. Guess what? There's going to be a temple. And that's why we have my friends. I don't mind saying the name of my friend Yehuda Glick and many people, others mm-hmm. are desperately, they don't, only, they, don't only, they, they don't only believe it's going to happen. They think they can be a part of that temple coming forward. Now, how that happens politically and those issues, I'm not going to get into that. But the people that believe that, that when we talk about Mashiach, when Messiah yeah. coming and reigning in the earth and people drawing unto the holy hill of God and coming to Jerusalem and offering themselves and offer, I mean, that to me is a powerful, powerful picture. And you know what? May it be in our time. May it be Look, in our generation. You, 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 amen. But you just brought up the, um, you know, the, the elephant in the room. And the elephant in oh, the of room I did. is that your friend yeah. Yehuda Glick was, uh, you know, shot for, for saying that Jews should have the right to pray on the Temple Mount. And um, and he knows what every Jew knows that one day that temple will be rebuilt, and until it's rebuilt, we we don't want to forget about it. Um, exactly. We we want to continue to visit there and and pray there, and um, and you know and, and the very reason why um, you know the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church, which is involved in the BDS, the you know the, the you know that, that anti-Semitic um, uh, program they have of of, of demonizing Israel, how can the, an entire denomination do that? Because in their view, Ezekiel 43 verse 19 is just a picture for the life of the church. It has nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with the Jews, nothing to do with Jerusalem. These are just pictures in the life of the church. And when you read about Ariel, we're just going to translate it as, I mean, think about that. Why do they translate Ariel as altar? Because they don't want people to know that here Ezekiel in the future is speaking about how this is going to be in Jerusalem. Because you go back to Isaiah 29, and Ariel is Jerusalem. So this isn't just all, some altar at the front of the church that's going to be a certain size. This is the altar that's going to be in Jerusalem. And that's why this is yeah. so significant. This is, this is why I think we need to understand what the Catholic and the Presbyterian and all those other denominations are thinking. Because I hear about this, and I, you know, my Jewish brothers and sisters are saying, well, don't you guys say you believe in the Bible? And it's really easy to say, oh, well, they don't take the Bible seriously. But it's worse than not taking the Bible seriously. What they've done is they've spiritualized it to the point where it no longer means what it literally and originally meant. Mm-hmm. Now, and let me say this. There are many, 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 many people, not only that are listening, but that aren't listening, who come from the same kind of tradition that I, I've come from yeah. that really, really earnestly desire 
to understand. Now, let me give you an example. And again, yeah. we might be regressing a little bit. I hope not. You know, I'm really glad that you brought this up yeah. with the REL because there are so many people in the that they just want to know. Teach it to me. Show it to me. Let me see it for myself. And they're really um, – um, 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 pro- prohibited from being able to have that interaction because they're not getting a chance to interact with the original language. I mean, look, you 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 can go to 15 different commentaries and they can tell you this is what the hearth was and the, and the altar. But to look at the Hebrew, to see the word, to know the history of the word, the context of the word, the meaning of the word, that's absolutely invaluable to people. And there are many people from my background that desire that. They just haven't had the access to it. So that's why for me, yeah. you know, sometimes I get a little quiet. Sometimes I go, oh, the Christians think Think that did you know what I really want to know? What I want to really know, and I think a lot of people want to know, what did it mean? What does it mean? And what will it mean? And I, I can throw the Methodists under the bus, and I can back that bus up three or four different times. But if we're not even having a dialogue about whether this is the Word of God, there's nothing to have it. There's no debate. Mm-hmm. You know, if if the debate was this is the Word of God, we believe it to be the Word of God. Now, what does it mean? Oh my gosh, this is the day I wait for. Yeah. This is the day I wait for. And unfortunately, that's not the case. It's very, very hard for me to even even to get into that. So, I mean, I appreciate you bringing it up. It's just it's just, it's a really difficult conversation for me. And, and I guess that's what's going to be nice about when we're together, because then you can kind of feel it. Uh, these, you know, these kinds of conversations where the word Ariel, like, why do we even care about that? Who cares about that verse? Who cares about that chapter? Who cares about that book? Who cares about that prophet? Just give us the end of the story. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. Let's uh, no, let's, uh, so, let's so move on. We, okay. Let's do a quick excursus of verse 19 and then, and then set the people free. I think, uh, or give them okay, give good. them homework. Um, and I'll tell yeah. you right now, you've got a lot of homework. Verses 20 through 27. I want you to look at. Um, the sin offerings and the altar and 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 the bulls and the okay, but let's we got to just say one. I I got one more thing to talk about in verse nineteen, and then if you have anything else, obviously you know sure. But we've got mm-hmm. this statement. It says, "And you shall give to the Kohanim Halevi'im, the Levitical priests who are from the seed of Zadok of Tzadok, who are who are close to me," says Lord Yehovah, "to serve me." Um, so who are these seed of Zadok? Who are these guys? And mm-hmm. so to understand that we've. We've got to go back to um, to two Samuel chapter eight verse seventeen, where it talks about in the time of David, there were two high priests. There was Zadok mm-hmm. the son of Ahituv, and there was Eviatar the son of Ahimelech, and um, it even goes back uh, further where Eviatar we we first hear about. Um, he was one of the survivors of the massacre of Nov, which was the city of the priests who they were wiped out by Saul's mm-hmm. uh, general Doeg the uh, Edomite, and um, and so his grand, he, he was a descendant of, of Eli, who, or Eli, who was the priest in Shiloh, um, and they, his family ended up in Nov. Um, and uh, so we have here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 7, that, that um, when Adoniahu, and we, I think we read that section, so Adoniahu tries to rebel against Solomon, and, or against David, really, and make himself king. And so he invites, invites Eviatar to be his high priest. You know, if you want to be legitimate, you've got to have – you got to have the general, and you've got to have the high priest to be a legitimate king. You have to have them on your side. So he invites Eviatar. He does not invite Sadok. He doesn't invite Zadok. And of course, we know the rebellion of Adoniahu is defeated. And so, one Kings two twenty six to twenty seven, and this is homework for people to look up. One Kings twenty two twenty six to twenty seven. Eviatar is banished from the priesthood to Anatot, uh, which is a suburb of Jerusalem. Uh, and that's in, and it says it's in fulfillment of the prophecy concerning Eli or Eli that he would his line would not continue. And then interestingly enough, we have Jeremiah, uh, hundreds of years later, the prophet Jeremiah, who is a Kohen, a priest from Anatot, and possibly very likely a descendant of this same Eviatar who was banished from the priesthood. In the meantime, while Jeremiah and Eviatar and their families on the outside, the line of Zadok, they are the high priests who continue. Uh, the line of high priests directly from Aaron, father to son, father to son, all the way through Aaron, uh, all the way from Aaron through Tzadok, and all the way down to um, the last high priest who we know about by name, who who was the high priest at the time of uh, Alexander the Great in the 330s BCE. His name is Yadua. That's mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. Um, But we've got this this line of Zadok, and they somehow are special, this line of high priests. So there's two places that mention them in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 44.15 and 48.11. 
I'll read you those, those from the King James. I'll read them. It says, but the priest, the Levites, the son of Zadok, that's Zadok in Hebrew, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith Lord Jehovah. Then Ezekiel 48:11, it shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, of the sons of Zadok, which have been, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. So there's something that Ezekiel is referring to that we don't exactly know about, where the Israelites and even the Levites went astray and did something wrong, but the line of Zadok, the high priest, they were loyal. And it's possible that simply, you know, the high priest in the temple continued to follow the truth while everybody else was, you know, worshiping idols and sinning. And um, mm-hmm. although it doesn't say exactly what mm-hmm. happened, uh, what's interesting is we, we see there's this chosen family of priests, meaning you've got the Levites, and among the Levites, you've got the Kohanim. And among the Kohanim, you have the sons of Sadok, the Bnei Sadok, the sons of Zadok who are the chosen family of priests. And of course, in Second Temple times, we have a group who are called the Sadducees. And, you know, the joke is to say they were sad, you see, except Sadducees is simply the Greek pronunciation of Tzadokim in Hebrew. That's what they're called mm-hmm. in, in Jewish sources, Tzadokim. Tzadokim and Tzadokim are the sons of Zadok. So there was a group of priests in mm-hmm. Second Temple time who at least ident- claimed and identified themselves to be the direct descendants of Zadok. Um, we do know in the time of Herod, the, Z- the Sadducees were usurped by this group that some that sometimes are called that they're called by their enemies the the Herodians. They themselves refer to themselves as the Bethusian, Bethusian Sadducees because they trace themselves to a to a, a high priest from Alexandria whose name was um, Bothus or Baitus. That's the Baitusim in Hebrew. Um, but the original Sadducees before the time of Herod. Um, and even some after the time of Herod, they were simply a direct continuation of these high priests in the time of uh, Ezekiel and then the high priests who are mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. Mm. Wow, amazing. Well, I I will say this, and you said that they have a lot of homework. I I didn't get a chance to give a a, a little minute here. I want to do something at the end if it's okay. In the beginning, uh, I really appreciated the fact you're talking about the uh, Aviv search, Nehemiah. And and, and one of the things that I I, I guess I wanted to kind of end with is like an overshadow of these last few verses. Yeah. And he talks about for seven days you're to provide a male goat daily for a sin offering. You're to provide a young bull and a ram from the flock, both without defect. For seven days they are to make atonement for the altar and cleanse it. Thus they will dedicate it at the end of these days, from the eighth day, giving a specific number on the priest, start to present your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings on the altar. Then it has this wonderful little phrase, and I just want to say this in terms of uh, my own ministry minute. You know, the whole entire mission of Biblical Foundations Academy International, BFAinternational.com, is to inspire people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. And there are so many, and again, this is why I get a little touchy, there are so many different organizations and movements that are building their faith, not on scripture, but building their faith on doctrine, building their faith on uh, tradition, building their faith on authority of man, building their faith on uh, a number of things that are mixtures of any number of, of things in the past. And what I really, really have continuously wanted to, to, to inspire people to do is to build their faith uh, based on scripture. And I'm talking about the word of God, that which has been given to us, that, you know, whether you're a person who's who started with the back of the book in the, in the New Testament, you always want to ask the question, where does this come from and what's the basis of it? And the person In the beginning, where does this come from and what's the basis of it? And what has been really exciting to me is to open up the scripture and to have this be the foundation uh, for my faith. At the end of this entire passage, it says, he says, he says, you shall do these things. And then it says, and I will, and I think in English, I think the word is real quickly, it says, and then I will accept you. Now, I want to give you one little chance to kind of do one last little thing before we do this. But what I've loved about the BFA International is for people to interact with language, history, and context, getting a chance to see information, interact with information, and, and to be able to let it be applied in their life. What I love about this last little word, I'm going to give you a chance on this last word, Nehemiah, is the last phrase. The last phrase before this last word, which is, let's see, uh, the ratziti, yeah, I will ratsa. Yeah. yeah, I will. So when you see, hear that, give, give, give me what, first thing that comes into your mind, I will what? Wow. Um, so it definitely means I will accept you. And it specifically yes. is a word that appears, especially in Leviticus, in the context of mm. God accepting our sacrifices. 
Um, in Amen. modern Hebrew, Amen. I should point out, uh, the word ratza, lirzot, ratziti, means to want. Ratziti is I want it. Yes. Uh, in biblical Hebrew, it doesn't... It, exactly. Ani rotze. Ani rotze lalechet la... So, rotze, ratziti, um, lirzot, means to uh, to want in modern Hebrew. Uh, in biblical Hebrew, mm-hmm. the word for want, incidentally, is chafetz. Um, mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in modern, in, sorry, in biblical Hebrew, ratziti means I, ex- uh, ratziti atchem is I accepted you. Um, and mm-hmm. dilzot is to accept a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So the reason I wanted to say this is that I, I really do believe that the opportunity that we have is, is and this is not easy. This is not going to be easy these next couple of weeks, Nehemiah, that we're about mm-hmm. to go into, where we're going to be interacting with the Word of God, that's language, history, and context, the depth, and the meaning of Scripture. There's going to be times where it's going to take us 30, 30, 30 40, 40 minutes just to deal with one phrase, just because it's that powerful and that amazing. Yeah. But what I love about it is how it ends, because this ultimately is what I want to be about with our ministry. For those who don't know, visit BFAInternational.com. Deal with God's time, deal with God's Torah, deal with God's tetragrammaton, enter the doors, see what's there. You can go. You don't have to make any commitment to anything, but there's always going to be an opportunity to, to take a step further and a step further. And ultimately, let me just say this. What I think that what we're about at BFA is to get to a place where you can make a sacrifice, a sacrifice of your effort to want to understand God and his will and his way in every way that you can. But at the end, after all the days and the cubits and the average and the sacrifices and everything else. It ends, and it says, <laughs> I love the way it says, it says, Neum Adonai Yehovah, saith, if we can say English in English, saith Lord, saith Adonai, Lord Yehovah. In other words, whatever has been proclaimed, whether it's six or seven days, whether it's cupid sacrifices, whatever it is, the end of the phrase, the end of the section is, Neum Adonai Yehovah. If he said it, he meant it, and therefore I want to live it. I want to live a life that if it's because it's something he said, I think it is a gift and a benefit to us to be able, as I say, it's not that I have to, I get to. I get to live a life that is pleasing to him, which makes me want to. You know, I, mean, it's just, I mean, because he said it. It's something that I want to do. So I know there's so much that we, we haven't gotten a chance to go into. We've already gone long enough here. I'm looking forward, Nehemiah, to be able to say, Chavez Shali, uh, my friend Nehemiah, and we're, 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 we're doing this, 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 this working together, uh, the, the, the Chavruta, to be able to, to, to build and, and to challenge and to, and to sharpen, and hopefully as a result of us being together in this next so may we be peacefully get there, no problems, no issues, to safely be in the same place under the same roof, opening up the word of God to find common ground. I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I hope people will continue to not only pray for us, but they will support us in every way that we can so that we can continue to do the work. I love the image that you brought earlier of the, of the two tribes, to be able to bring uh, the fruit of our labor uh, to the people that they might be able to build their faith in a way that that is applicable and that is practical uh, and that's helpful to them in their lives. So that's what I wanted to say. I'd like to pray if I can. I've had a, I've had Please. an extremely difficult last few weeks <laughs> uh, doing this, and, and and I really appreciate the patience. I think uh, our editor will be a lot happier this time. <laughs> we won't have as many as many things, but I would like to say a prayer if that's okay. Please. And unless there's anything else you want to say, you don't. Please, you, go okay? Ahead. you okay? Yep. I want to say a prayer. Father, I just want to thank you. Uh, when we hear the words, when we see the words, Neum Adonai Yehovah, it's something that you said. And what a blessing it is that we get a chance to apply and look forward to applying it in our life. We ask your blessing and protection over us as we travel from different parts of the world to be able to be at a place of common ground, to open the scriptures again, and to be able to share that which you give us through revelation and through study and just through practicality, being able to see the words in their language, history, and context. Bless the people as we continue to do this. In the end, we'll give you all the praise, glory, and honor for your goodness and your grace. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Profit Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit NehemiasWall.com and BFA International.